Heavenly Family, again, we want to thank you. We always just want to thank you for loving us so much. And we want to thank you for bringing us together to keep these feasts, to, um, you know, making us aware that these things even exist and that it's for our benefit. And so we thank you for them. We thank you for the fellowship that we have. We thank you for the scriptures, for preserving them. And we thank you for continuing to make the light shine upon these scriptures brighter and brighter and brighter. And so we want to ask that as we go and search these things, that we not just make the mistake of those in the past and take them and understand a theory of the truth and have our heads swell and be full of pride, but we want to understand these scriptures and we want to understand what they mean for us and we want to learn the lessons that they are in a that they are intended to teach us, that we not make the same mistakes as those have made in the past and that we have made in the past. We want to accept your life. We want to accept your righteousness. We want to put aside that old man and take you on to be our life. Thank you so much, Heavenly Family. Guide us and please help me to be able to communicate your truth in its full and very real weight. Thank you so much, Heavenly Family. In the name of the branch, he and she, amen. All right, so we're going to be looking at Ezekiel 5. And it is... A chapter that we could go into a lot of detail on. We're not going to go into as much detail as we potentially could. There's a book on the back table on Ezekiel 5 that goes, in, goes into this in more detail than we will right now. But there are also some aspects of this that we're going to look into that are not in the book. So it'll be uh, important to consider everything. And I do want to mention, too, that we're, we are going to try to cover a lot in a short period of time. So if we could keep comments to a minimum or if there's questions, if there's a really necessary question, feel free to ask it. But if there's other questions or other comments that could be saved till the end, try to remember them and if you want to write them down. We want to be able to talk about things after and everything, but it's just that we do want to be able to cover everything that would be good to cover at this time. So, for illustrative purposes, there are some pictures that I had seen um, quite a while back where there's this guy, um, Michael Booskin, who is a painter and he had illustrated a lot of these, um, or at least some of the aspects of Ezekiel 5. And so, I wanted to show you guys his website, and if you scroll up a bit, I... Yeah, that's right. There we go. Yeah, uh, it's profitasartist.com. So www.profitasartist.com. And that's what some of the pictures we're going to look at. They're all on this website, and we're actually going to just view them on the website. And so it's a, you'll see it's very good painting. And the idea behind his website is he's depicting scenes where prophets were doing some sort of prophecy in an artistic way. And so he, as an artist, finds interest in that and is trying to capture that in painting. And I, I find it really interesting. Um, so you can actually go to the top again and go to the next one. This is the uh, illustration of Ezekiel laying on his side for the 390 years. And you have here portrayed, you know, him holding the pan and the rest of it. So this is kind of Ezekiel 4, right? You can go to the next picture now. 
This is the beginning of Ezekiel 5. He was to say, take a razor or a sword, and I find it interesting that the artist chose to portray this more so as a sword, because the word literally means sword. You know, and it's, it is significant for the symbolism here. So what we're going to do now as this picture up, is up, um, hopefully you all have Bibles with you, and if not... These are, these are, these are artwork for sale. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. He, uh, you know, he, I'm pretty sure he sells them, and it's all... Gentleman's name again? It's uh, Michael, uh, I think it's... Buskin. Yeah, Buskin. Yes. B-U-E-S-K-I-N-G. Yeah, and for those of you on WebEx, uh, of course this is being recorded and you'll get to see the pictures or you can just go on the website and see it. Uh, yeah, so if you go back to the second one, there we go. This is a uh, painting, of course, of Ezekiel shaving his head by use of a sword. So do you think that you could just uh, read the chapter for us now? Sure. And then... If, um, if you guys want to follow along in your Bibles, then this picture will be here. There's a place in Proverbs where hair is equal to sons. So it's the slaying of sons. Mm -hmm. The slaying of sons. That's It's being symbolized by the cutting of the hair. Interesting. There's, and we'll get into more aspects of what hair represents. And that definitely fits in with the symbolism as we're going to consider it. Hair representing sons or children or etc. So Ezekiel chapter 5, and our focus here, what we're going to primarily cover is just verses 1 to 13. So for sake of time, if you just want to read that, the book on the back table goes through the whole chapter. Um, but what we'll do is we'll, our focus will be on verses 1 to 13, and then I'll briefly mention the rest of it and Ezekiel 6 and 7 and 8. Go ahead. Um, must I understand when, when, when the Bible generally says statutes and judgments, mm -hmm. it's alluding to Moses and... Uh, generally speaking, it's okay. referring to the thing which came through Well, Moses. I'm going there because I know Ezekiel 5 mentions a lot of judgments and statutes and all that. We have people, and that is yeah. the whole ceremonial system. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's all part of that. So yes, Ezekiel chapter 5, starting at verse 1. 1 to 13, yeah. And thou, son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thy beard. Then take thee balances to weigh, and divide the hair. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city, when the days of the siege are fulfilled. And thou shalt take a third part and smite about it with a knife, and a third part thou shalt scatter in the wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. Thou shalt also take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirts. Then take of them again and cast them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. For thereof shall a fire come forth into all the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. And she hath changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations, and my statutes more than the countries that are round about her. For they have refused my judgments and my statutes. They have not walked in them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Because ye multiplied more than the nations that are round about you, and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are round about you, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, am against <coughs> thee, and will execute judgments in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. And I will do in thee that which I have not done, and whereunto I will not do any more the like, because of all thine abominations. 
Therefore the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, and the sons shall eat their fathers. And I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter into all the winds. Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely, because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things, and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee. Neither shall mine eye spare, neither will I have any pity. A third part of thee shall die with the pestilence, and with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee. And a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee. And I will scatter a third part into all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. Thus shall mine anger be accomplished, and I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be comforted, and they shall know that I am the Lord have spoken it in my zeal when I have accomplished my fury in them. All right. So, what does it all mean, right? <laughs> That's the question. That's what we're going to consider. We see it starts off with this, the shaving of the head at the end of the days of the siege. And it's clearly symbolic actions that are being done. And he takes the third part, and a third part, and a third part, burns the first third part in the midst of the city, takes the second third part, and actually smites it about the city, round about the city with a sword, which we'll get to, and then scatters the last third part to the wind. And then he takes another third part, or not another third part, rather, but he takes some of them and binds them in his skirt, or in his garment, or in the wing of his garment, more literally. And then he takes some of them and puts them again in the fire. And that's what we're going to look at first. Oh, and we'll see what all that means. <laughs> that's funny that you say that. We're, so we're going to look at these things. So the third, and third part he divided up into parts of that third part. Well, there was part of those that the idea is that there was a part, a small part, doesn't say how much. It says few in number. He was to take hairs few in number and bind them in his skirt. And part of the idea of that is to protect them from the judgments that take place to those three third parts. Right? So, but then he takes some of them and throws them into the fire. So we're going to see what this all is. But it's clearly judgment. It's clearly representing this investigative judgment for the living at the end of the 430 years, as Hoth talked about. So we saw 1525 plus 430, 1955. So we're going to see if these things do tell what took place at that time, it should confirm for us that 430 years, and it should teach us lessons of what has been taking place since that time. Now, before we begin, we want to read a couple quotes. So if you could go to the first page of the notes here. All right. The first quote is actually from Hotef. And these are just my personal notes. Um, I haven't, I'm not going to have them up the whole time because I want to look back at those pictures. But there are some important statements here that uh, we can certainly benefit from. So this first statement is from Tract 3, The Judgment of the Harvest, written by Victor Hodef, page 3. And I recommend for everyone to read that book. It's, of course, concerning the judgment of the harvest. And this is what it says. And regardless of someone's view of Hodef, let's consider the statement based off of its own value. You know, as in, let's just see what the statement says. Though it is the crowning work of our salvation and the setting up of the kingdom of Christ upon earth. Yet, the investigative judgment is one of the least understood and most mystified and confused Bible subjects of the age. Were it not essential to our salvation, the enemy would not have expended every possible effort to envelop it in darkness. 
imperative then is the unremitting need to search the scriptures as for hidden treasure and to beseech God for the guidance of His Spirit in order rightly to understand this all-important subject. In vain, though, will be any search for truth unless the motive be to learn and to do the will of God. Hence, if any man, says Jesus, will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God. John 7:17. 7, and this, of course, is letting us know, okay, we should not, we're told by Victor Hodaf that the message of Elijah is the message of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the message of the judgment for the living. If this is one of the most confused and mystified subjects, should we really be closed to learning more about it? No, right? We need to be open. There could very well be new light on this subject, and I'm sure there will be, as we continue on, much more new light on this subject. So if you scroll down to the next quote, this is from Selected Messages, page, uh, volume 2 actually, Selected Messages, volume 2, page 108. And this is one which is very important to pay attention to because Ellen White tells us an important principle here. She says here, Not one cloud has fallen upon the church that God has not prepared for. Not one opposing force has risen to counterwork the work of God, but He has foreseen. All has taken place as He has predicted through His prophets. He has not left His church in darkness, forsaken, but has traced in prophetic declarations what would occur, and through His providence, acting in its appointed place in the world's history, He has brought about that which His Holy Spirit inspired the prophets to foretell. All his purposes will be fulfilled and established. So notice here, the, there's a few really important principles here, but what we want to emphasize is that according to this statement, anything, and I'll even just make it easier to accept what Elmite is saying here, any major thing that has ever been here in the history of the world that the devil has tried to use to counterwork the work of God, God has pointed it out in the prophecies of Scripture. So, a minute ago, Stephen mentioned Waco. <laughs> I just want to mention something about that. The whole incident in 1993 with David Koresh, without a doubt, has been used greatly to counterwork the work of God. It has blackened the name of Branch Davidians. It has blackened the name of Davidians. It has blackened the name of Adventists. You know, I've seen before where people, the irreligious of the world, I've seen them use the incident with David Koresh to say, see, that's what religion leads to, you know, and to use that as an excuse for not investigating religious things. And then I've seen people of other religions use that whole incident with David Koresh to blacken Christianity. And then Sunday keeping Christians go and they, I've seen where they've gone from William Miller and trace the history all the way through to David Koresh and see, see, that's where Millerism leads to. That's where Adventism leads to. Then Adventists say, oh, see, that's where Davidians lead. Davidians say, oh, see, those branch Davidians. When the reality of it is that David Koresh, and we've talked about this before and we have all the information documented, was not a branch Davidian. He was associated with it for a few years, and then he formed a separate association under a separate name in opposition to the work of the Holy Spirit Feminine that was being brought forward by Lois Roden. So, not only that, but if you watch these documentaries about the cults and everything, usually, in most of the documentaries that I've seen, the incident with Dave Kresh is saved as the climax, and that incident is used to even blacken the whole idea of prophets or continued inspiration. You know, because, oh, here he was, he's claimed to be a prophet, and look how crazy it is, and, you know. So without a doubt, that incident has been used, perhaps more than any other, well, I'll say definitely more than any other when it comes to branch Davidians, and more than any other when it comes to Davidians as well, 
And probably the second to that is the situation with Florence Hottis, which we'll be discussing. And it's been used dramatically to blacken the Advent movement from the perspective of Sunday keepers and other religions and people in the world. Stephen? On the other side of the coin, mm -hmm. Waco is a watershed event for a lot of peacekeeping Christians, but not just them. A lot of people who see that there was a marked breach in the Constitution oh, yeah. regarding the use of military against American citizens. Oh, definitely. And um, yeah. so it, it's a watershed event mm -hmm. uh, to others that is, they're not making a judgment against the Davidians. They're just saying that That's this true. event that happened here is a breach uh, of, of constitutional rights. Definitely. From the perspective of many in the United States, um, groups like We Are the People, or We the People, I think is the name of it, We the People and other truther movements, you know, really their primary focus on that 1993 event is, like you're saying, the breach of the, well, the government basically going against the constitutional rights of American people and persecuting fellow citizens. And that's why guys like Alex Jones... Using military. Using military, exactly. So those, these, this is kind of a, a standout event in the history of religion, in the history of America, in the history of the downfall of human rights, <laughs> you know. So this is something to take note of. And so when we consider Ellen White's statement here, shouldn't we at least consider the possibility that that event and some of the things surrounding that event that have been used so much to blacken the truth and the truth of our Heavenly Family and the truth of feast days. I've seen too on online forums because at one point David Koresh had uh, at New Mount Carmel Center where this incident took place um, on one of the doors he had a sign saying Messianic Congregation and so that's been used against Messianic Jews as well. You know, so. Is it possible, at least, that some of these things are delineated in prophetic lines in the scriptures? Mm -hmm. Is it at least possible? So let's consider, let's consider, and let's look at the scriptures and see what they have to say. But again, we're not starting from that point, right? And that's not necessarily even our focus. But I wanted to mention that as an example, since Stephen already pointed out, you know, that event. And let's just say, okay, we know that it's been used. We're told that our Heavenly Family has seen everything that's used against God's people and has declared it in prophetic lines through the ancient prophets. And now we're looking at this thing, talking about the judgment for living. We know that the judgment begins at the house of God. And we see Ezekiel 4, this 430-year siege, 1525 to 1955. Then Ezekiel shaves his head. So now if you could go back to the pictures... We want to look at this one picture, which will be the next one. Next tab. Yeah, right there. What Ezekiel was told to do, and this is just to further illustrate and bring to our minds what's taking place here, he was to weigh the hair in the balances, right? Judgment. It's a very easy symbol. Now, there's something that I would like to read and this is actually from the Ezekiel 5 study on the back. Um, and Doug, the guy who wrote the study, he made a few good observations about the first four verses of Ezekiel 5. So we've already read them. We're not going to read them again. But in the quote, he reads them and then makes these observations. He points out here, he says, Therein we find that when the days of the siege are fulfilled, Ezekiel was to shave his head and beard, symbolizing a purification. Leviticus 14, verses 8 and 9, Numbers 6, verses 9 and 18, and judgment, Isaiah 7, verse 20. It's actually verse 20, I think I said 22 before, of the church. The purification and the judgment revealed therein is shown to be in four phases. So here are the four phases. And actually, maybe it will be useful to put this on the screen. So you can go back to the Ezekiel notes here. As I 
scroll down here. Okay. Now this is it right here. This is good. These are the four phases. So first, the first third part of hair was to be burned with fire in the midst of the city. Uh, don't know what happened. Um, yeah, me neither. There we go. That's the first part. First third part burned in the midst of the city. The second third part was to be smitten with a knife or sword round about the outside of the city. The third third part was to be scattered in the wind and a sword, a sword was to be drawn out after it. Four, after Ezekiel bound a small remnant of the hair, if you remember, in his skirt, he was to take a portion of them and burn them in the fire. And from there, a fire was to go forth into all the house of Israel. Now you can go back to the picture, and actually if you could go to the next picture. This is the casting of the first third part into the midst of the city, and the way it's illustrated here is as a tile with the city portrayed on it, and a fire being burned in the midst of the city. Now, as we'll see, unfortunately, the artist didn't portray the second stage of things, of uh, the second third part being smitten round about the city with a sword, but he did portray the third third part being scattered to the wind. But we're going to focus on this section first. Now, this is the beginning of the investigative judgment for living, as we're seeing. Ezekiel shaving his head, etc., etc. We were told, and we already read the statement from Hadith, where there is a, uh, in Malachi chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, another description of the beginning of the investigative judgment for living. And we found out, this was the statement from Jezreel letter number 9, page 2. The main points of that were that the judgment for the living does not start with a slaughter, but it starts with a message as a swift witness to the outstanding sins. Then we also saw in that statement that the judge, this is the order of things, the judgment for living commences, the Lord is a swift witness against the sins, and then he reassures them that his statutes and ordinances are not done away with, that all things will be restored, right? Now, 1955, what took place? Was there a message that came as a swift witness? against the outstanding sins? Was there a message that came that reassured us that the ancient statutes and ordinances are not done away with, but that all things are to be and are being restored? Seven letters to... Leroy is saying seven letters to Florence Hodges. The seven letters to Florence Hodges, just for those who aren't familiar with what that is, uh, when Ben Roden first uh, begun with the message that he received. Uh, it was three months after Victor Hodef died that he first was called to, as some would say, the prophetic office, or however you want to term it. But he was called to write letters to Florence Hodef. Basically what happened, uh, and this it's an important history to understand, and it's a sad history, but we want to talk about it and lay it out before ourselves. So Victor Hodef, in 1929, is when he began his ministry, and it first started with further light that he received on Isaiah chapter 54 to 66. And that developed into Shepherd's Rod Volume 1, and then, you know, the truth of the purification of the church, and then the announcement of the kingdom being established on earth, starting in the land of Israel. And... Coming closer and closer to the end of his ministry, he was emphasizing more and more the soon coming of the investigative judgment upon the living. February 5, 1955, Victor Hodef died. Within 24 hours, his wife, Florence Hodef, had taken over the association, which, as Ben Roden showed later through uh, documents of executive council minutes, meeting minutes, and different things like that. They weren't, uh, Florence Hodef and the others who were usually part of the leading body of the Davidian Association, at that point, were not members of that council. 
so they had no authority to make whatever actions they did. And in fact, they had even no membership with the association. The paperwork was there, but Hodges had never signed it, right? That's just a minor detail, but it's just creating this picture for us of, okay, so Florence Hodges within 24 hours takes over and she gets, um, I forget who it was, but she basically got those who were prior to that the basically governing body of the association to sign over um, leadership to her and that she would have life insurance for her um, and someone else, I think, was it her son or something? I guess she didn't have a son, did she? It was for her and her brother, I think that's what it was, to be taken care of financially for the rest of their lives. So steps in right away and gets this. So she's taken care of, she's set for life. That's within 24 hours. You'd think that perhaps she would be distraught and going through mourning, and you know, but this is what she did right away. And then very soon after that, she started promoting her interpretation of the 42 months of Revelation 11, claiming that in 1959, the slaughter of Ezekiel 9 would take place and the kingdom would be established. And one of the other things that she did in order to secure her financial well-being was she took around um, $470,000 worth, uh, worth of second tithe of those that were part of the association and attributed it to herself and a few others who were part of the leadership. Along with that, taking whatever uh, was there of the first tithe, which left the ministers out in the field going forward proclaiming the Davidian message basically without anything to be supported by. And the second tithe was for the support of the less fortunate ones in our midst. So all of a sudden, they are without care, right? So all these things were taking place. Ben Roden, three months after this, and there's actually a prophecy concerning this, um, which is in the back of this book, which we didn't get into, The End of Davidian Quiescence, the last Part of the last section of this book gets into these parts which we're going to skip over for the sake of time. He was instructed to write letters to Florence Hodiff and the uh, now newly propped up Executive Council rebuking the evils and calling them to accept new light. And he was called to sign these letters uh, with the name the branch at the end, as being Christ's new name. Now this part we haven't talked about that much this time, but basically what it is, Hodges talks about a new name being revealed at the end of the 430 years. Well, in the scriptures, the only thing that could possibly justify that, a new name being revealed at the end of the 430 years, is Exodus 6, where the name Yahweh, or Yahuwah, or however you want to pronounce it, the Tetragrammaton, was given to Moses at the end of the 430 years. And the scenario there, what a lesson that we learned from that, and we won't get into all the details and how the name actually existed before that time, because Abraham knew it and everything, we won't go into all the details for that and the reasons why, but essentially that was the new name that came at the end of the 430 years in the type. So in the anti-type, the new name revealed at the end of the 430 years although Hadaf was right in saying it's the name of the church, is actually the new name of Christ, which is what Ellen White talked about as being the third part of the threefold seal of the 144,000. You had the seal of God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star containing Jesus' new name. Ben Roden gave many studies explaining this, so we won't get into all the details, but just to tell it to you, unfortunately, without being able to provide any detailed evidence at this point, but just to just say it out to you so you can have the ideas in your mind. Basically what it is, is the seal of God, this three-part seal, God, New Jerusalem, Jesus' new name, is that the seal of God, Ellen White clearly explained to be the Sabbath. And it's a message of truth. She says that the being sealed is settling into the truth intellectually and spiritually, right? So these truths have to be revealed. So there's the seal of God, and won't go into all the details as to why, the second part of the seal was New Jerusalem, which deals with the establishment of the kingdom, 
which was a representation of the truth brought in the message that Victor Hodas proclaimed. And then there's this third part, Jesus' new name. And we understand from the prophecies of Zechariah and Revelation primarily that Christ's new name is the branch. And that's in the back of this study that goes into that. Then I also recommend on that back table over there, there is a study by A.T. Jones called The Greater Purpose, where he discusses the work of Christ under the name of the branch. And it's really interesting when you understand uh, what Jones was trying to get at, especially in light of what we currently understand in the branch message. So I highly recommend that study. It's called The Greater Purpose. It's on the smaller back table. Stephen. Uh, from your perspective and the history of, of your people, mm -hmm. I understand where you're coming from and going from, or a tiny bit, I understand. Right. Um, Tom Caldwell and I have t talked a little bit uh, online or in emails. Mm -hmm. And to me, the scripture that says, this is the name wherewith he shall be called, right. or this is the name wherewith she shall be called, right. that that is a prophecy of a new name. Right. And um, uh, that's Yehud. It's uh, a Say uh, Kenu, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and that was obtained by him relative <coughs> to becoming um, the lamb and being slain. And then <coughs> lived. I'm wanting to not interrupt you, but I, I right. see multiple aspects of 430 years. And you're right. only talking about maybe two of them. There are multiple aspects to 430 years. Along with the 40-year thing. Right. No, what I'll mention is that there are multiple aspects of this that we aren't addressing simply for sake of time. We can't address all that. What we want to focus, our focus here in particular, is trying to understand Ezekiel 5 in what we believe to be the perfect fulfillment of those 430 years. There are other applications of it that all bear their own lessons. But we believe that if there's to be a perfect fulfillment, that it must run in connection and run into Ezekiel 5, because that's the natural progression of the scriptures themselves. So that's our focus on this. The whole thing about Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, Jeremiah 33, verses 15 and 16, and Christ's new name and the rest of that, the connection there, you mentioned about the Lamb, we won't go into all the reasons for this right now, but we can talk about it later, as to why the name The Branch applies, especially in the latter days. One of the reasons for that, and why the name The Branch, uh, Ellen White connects it with uh, the last, or the latter part, she calls it the final phase of the uh, atonement, which is the judgment for the living. She connects it with that, and the reason why is because the branch in particular is not in connection, the name of the branch is not in particular in connection with the building of the first temple, but with the building of the second temple. The, there's a lot of work, Hada talked a lot about this, but I've seen articles, very scholarly articles, showing how the New Testament believers, clearly in the scriptures, considered the New Testament church to be in some sense a fulfillment of Solomon's temple. One quick example of that is Christ being the chief cornerstone. But there is this second temple, and the second temple prophecies deal with the latter day movement, the latter day church, if you want to use that term. And the prophecies which deal with the branch are not in relation to that first temple, but they are in relation to that second temple. And some studies that I could cite people to on that is Victor Hodov's study on Zechariah 6 with the mountains and the horses, and you know, it's called The Great Paradox. It's track two in Victor Hodov's literature. Also, Shepherd's Rod, volume two, he goes a lot into temple typology of first and second temple. So one of the main things is that that second temple 
is where the name the branch applies. And that second temple is that which applies to the latter days as revealed in Zechariah's prophecies. So that's just one brief point, but we can get back, we can discuss that later for sure. So basically what, just to go back to the history of this, where Ben Roden, he was called at that time to write letters to Florence Hoddeth and to the leadership of the, the uh, Davidians at that time and to rebuke the wickedness that was going on, which I briefly mentioned and which we'll get a little bit more into, and that he was to sign it by the name The Branch as being the new name of Christ. And then, shortly after that, he started talking about and writing about the keeping of the feast days and the daily and how the ceremonial law was not done away with, but that it is still applicable today in its antitypical phase. That what took place at the cross and at the time of Christ was not an end to the law, but it was an advancement of the law from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. And that we, in connection with the heavenly sanctuary, still have a part to play in the keeping of the antitypical ceremonial law. So these are things that Ben Roden discusses in his studies. So let's just back to the statement from Hadith where he said, the judgment for living begins with a message that is a swift witness to the outstanding evils in the midst. And then there is the reassurance that none of the ancient statutes and judgments have been done away, but that all things are to be restored. So brief mention. Now what we want to do is quickly discuss the connection of this. Did you have something to say? Yeah, so yeah. the message then would be surrounding the, um, as it were, the statement or a call to observe the ceremonial um, um, services these days in Iraq. But wasn't that message, or wasn't that a part of the, what should I call this? I know there's a faction from the Evans Church that, you know, started keeping those feast days after 844. Well, there was a, I'll put it like this, the feast days and the Sabbath, in one sense, they've been lost, but in another sense, they've been preserved, right? There's always been small remnants of people who have observed these things, right? And at Adventism, there was some discussion of the feast days, but the general idea, at least at the beginning of Adventism, they understood that the moral law is now being restored, the knowledge of the moral law, and that um, the ceremonial law, they generally believed that it was nailed to the cross, right? Well, in 1888, they were definitely clarifying that and showing that uh, all these scriptures, and in fact, in 1888, Jones and Wagner, their main emphasis was not on trying to convince people to keep the feast days or the ceremonial law, but their main emphasis was on the gospel and the meaning of these passages in the New Testament that were kind of being uh, controverted or they were being uh, disputed as to their meaning. And what came out as a result of the message which they were given was that all of these passages which are used to say any part of the law was done away with, simply do not mean that. But that they do teach, and actually Jones and Wagner, what they did show, in addition to that, they did have somewhat of, of, of an emphasis on showing that the ceremonial law is applicable today, but they didn't really get into how or why or anything like that. But they said that the ceremonial law is the gospel. In one place, Wagner says, the ceremonial law is justification by faith, because justification by faith is the gospel, right? So Ellen White, she says it's the compact gospel in type. How the different will it be now in, say, after that, 1955, this new message coming in? That sure. Thing. And actually, I'll, I'll fill in a, a gap between then. After 1888 and the Rod message came, the Rod message was more so focusing on prophecies which showed that these things would be restored to us. But it didn't actually, Hadaf never uh, went to actually reinstitute the keeping of the feast days or anything like that. In fact, he put a pause 
on the Lord's Supper for the Davidians, as you guys are aware of because of some of the discussions going on, right? There was a pause on it because he said, we don't know how or when to keep these things, so we need to wait for it to be revealed to us. And so basically what, what happened with Hadith is that Hadith, he, I'll give one example, in Tract 4, he, well, there's a study that he wrote in 1934, and it was Tract 4 in a series of tracts that he wrote. And it was called The Latest News for Mother. And it was going through the prophecy of Hosea chapter 1 and 2. And one of the parts of that prophecy is Hosea chapter 2 verse 11, which says, you know, I will cause your mirth to cease, your feast days, your new moons, etc., etc., etc. And the common Christian interpretation of that is that God is the one who stopped the feast days from being kept and that God held them as an abomination. But Hadaf showed from that prophecy that that's saying the same thing as Daniel 7.25. That that's saying that, and he, he chronicled and showed how the fulfillment of that, tracing through the prophecy of Hosea 1 and 2, is that the feast days and the new moons and all these things would be taken away after Christ had already come. And so he showed that they were taken away and that they would have to be restored. That's just one example. Then there's the statement that we already looked at where Hadaf said that these things would be restored. And restored so, meaning pre kingdom. Uh, well, he didn't specify necessarily in all places. However, there are instances where Hadaf talks about according to Nahum's prophecy, we are to keep the feasts and then march on to the kingdom. Okay. Right? So in, in Hadaf's writings, he was showing how, hey, look, these things would have to be restored, right? And more specific the prophecy in Nahum? A uh, Nahum 115, it talks about because keeping... My, yeah. my view of the perfect fulfillment is after the judgment of, of the wicked. O oh, Judah, keep your feasts, for the wicked will never pass through you right. again. Well, here's the thing. That statement, keep your feasts, for the wicked will never pass through again, the implication of that is that the reason why you are to keep the feasts is because the wicked will no more pass through you again. In other words, keep the feast because this is going to point us to being in a condition so that we can pass through the judgment. So that's how... Relative to Hosea in particular, my understanding is, is the feasts are to be kept by a righteous nation. Right. Because of wickedness, right. he allowed them to be taken away from them. Your book Lamentations. Right. He's taken away and he's disregarded the king and the priest. He's taken away his sanctuary as if it were a garden. And he's disregarded the, the <coughs> moons and the, and the Sabbaths and the feasts. Exactly. It was as a punishment. Okay. It was as a punishment. But then when righteousness is arising, then they're restored. The way that Hadaf explained it is he gave um, the taking away of the feast days in the Dark Ages, he paralleled it to the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar and how it was a punishment because of their wickedness, right? So there is a restoration from that. But here's the thing. Sometimes we think, oh, well, we shouldn't keep the feast days until we are all righteous or to a certain level of righteousness or whatever. Here's the thing, Leviticus chapter 23, verse uh, 37. These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire, or for the purpose of offering an offering made by fire, etc., etc., a burnt offering, and a meat offering, a sacrifice and a drink offering, everything upon his day. One of the primary purposes of the feast, as also chronicled in Numbers chapter 28 and 29, is for sacrifices. This is very significant. We're told, I have to go on a little bit further here, but remember what you're going to say. We are told that we can obtain righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, right? And how we do that in Romans chapter 6, verse, actually, not remembering the exact verse, it's just before verse 20, verses 15 to 20, somewhere in there. It says that we obtain this righteousness by willfully 
obeying from the heart that form of doctrine which was given to us. And it likens that, obtaining the righteousness of Christ, to a death to self and a rising to a new life in Christ. When we do that, when we go to Christ and offer ourselves to Him, we are that sacrifice. We are sacrificing our nothing, which is our everything. And that is a keeping, antitypically, of the ceremonial law, right? So, in other words, what that is just letting us know is that this whole thing of keeping the feasts and of keeping the appointed times and keeping the sacrifices in antitype and all this, this is a necessary thing. This is the gospel to point us to salvation and in us coming to Christ to receive salvation, even if it's ignorant in our own minds, we are in coming to Him for salvation, keeping the ceremonial law. And that is the only way we can keep the moral law, the law of righteousness. And I use these terms because they're regular terms that we're used to. So in other words, the ceremonial law, the feast days and all that, it is to bring us to righteousness. That's not to say, I don't want to confuse this, I don't want to convey that we become righteous by coming here to these meetings and keeping the feast. If we do these things as a form, it not only will be no benefit to us, but it will be our degradation, right? But the truth of these things is that they are to bring us to Christ to receive His righteousness. Yeah, it's to say. Oh, several different things. <laughs> uh, what I was starting to interrupt you with is I have a statement from Ellen White where she right. says we need to teach our young people that they are to offer up their lives Amen. as whole burnt offerings. Right. Amen. Okay. Amen. And um, just a little egg to me, I do not um, hold that the feast days, these sacred times of, a, of meeting or the right. sacred appointments mm -hmm. for the feasts, that they are ceremonial. They are not. Okay. Okay. They, they, ex <laughs> they are moral explanations explaining the Sabbath more fully. They are not ceremonial. The Sabbath was never ceremonial, and neither were the sacred appointments. Now, what there was a law that was added because of transgression, mm -hmm. which is the sacrificial law that points forward to what you just described, mm -hmm. the laying of our souls, ourselves, our lives on the altar for heaven to use however heaven pleases. Right. Okay? And uh, at Pentecost, there were 120 living sacrifices upon which descended fire as surely as it did on the, on the, the old covenant sacrifice. Okay? So... Um, you have a rub with me when you call feast days ceremonial. I'll try and clarify that. I don't believe that in the scriptures there is a cut and dry boom moral law, boom ceremonial law. When I say ceremonial, I don't mean formal either. I do believe that the feast days are part of the moral law. Okay? I don't disagree with that. But I believe that the moral law and the, well, I'll put it like this, the moral law, I'll say the Ten Commandments and the feast days necessitate connection and being part and parcel with ceremonial law. You know, there were specific ceremonies connected with all of these things, with the feast days, with the Sabbath, exactly. So, and all these things, you could refer to tithe as being both moral, because it is a moral obligation, and ceremonial, because you're actually acting out a thing, it's giving an offering, right? And so these things are not not to be viewed as opposed one to another, but working together. And so these things, they're all to teach us moral lessons. In fact, the whole ceremonial law was given to teach us morality, right? It's, it's all connected together, working... Where I come from is the feast days existed in heaven before <coughs> Lucifer fell. Right. The feast days were given to Adam and Eve before they fell. Mm -hmm. And so they are moral. The law of sacrifices was added because of their sin. Right. And when it was time to meet with Elohim, mm -hmm. 
sinful man could not meet with Elohim and live. Yeah. So now you need a divine substitute. Yeah, and there's on but, that. But see, rel- it, that's the one perspective of the cross. The, the other says that the, the statement where the enter at the straight gate. Well, the straight gate is the gate where the sacrificial animals went in. Right. Okay. Uh, the, the teaching that I just heard from out of your mouth real condensed there about how the sacrificial system also points to us being converted right. and and yielding to Messiah living his life out in this body. Amen. Amen. And there is a distinction that you correctly made between what is only here because of transgression and what pre-existed in heaven and the rest of that, right? On top of that, we're also told that Christ is the Lamb who is slain from the foundation of the world. And that the plan of salvation, as being expressed through the ceremonial law, existed before the creation of the earth even, right? Now, and that's a beautiful thing, you know? Now, there's more details that we'll discuss later when it comes to this, but I want to try and suck this back to Ezekiel 5 and try to go through some things here. But this, I'm really enjoying this discussion, by the way. <laughs> you know, all these things are really good. But I mean, if we get to yeah. that another time, because I want to finish that as well. Mm-hmm. But even as we stand here, you know, Christendom, Seventh-day Adventists, and all that, talking about the moral law or ceremonial law, right. making a distinction between the Sabbath being uh, moral or ceremonial. Right. But if then our parents says, we're going to do away with the ceremonial law, but let's keep the Sabbath where does the Sabbath fit in there? If the Sabbath was ceremonial. Exactly. Right. Well, the problem is that the way that most Adventists deal with things is that there is the Ten Commandments, and that is the law, you know? Plus tithes and some of the food laws, some of the time, <laughs> you know? But it's really what we have to understand is that the whole law is true and endures forever. And that it was always intended that the system of the sanctuary would transfer from the earthly and the types to the heavenly and the reality to which the types pointed. This was always the intention. Even if, you know, it wasn't always understood or known by us little people here on earth, right? But, um, okay, we want to go back because we don't want to lose some of the connections being made with Ezekiel 5 and some of these other things, right? Ezekiel 5, the beginning of the investigative judgment for living. Malachi 3, the beginning of the investigative judgment for living. The harvest. Now this is something that Victor Hodoff goes into into some detail. We won't be getting into all the aspects. But he shows in the book, The Judgment and the Harvest, quite clearly that the harvest is also the judgment. The harvest is the judgment. And so, basically, the first thing that takes place in Ezekiel 5, is the judgment upon the first third part of hair. We talked about hair. Um, Stephen pointed out hair, and I would love to find that reference, or if you could find it in Proverbs, um, but in case anyone didn't hear, uh, Stephen mentioned a reference in Proverbs where it likens hair unto sons, right? And sons, in my study of the word sons in Hebrew, it is gender inclusive. They're or I'll put it like this, the way that one guy put it, one linguist, is that in the masculine of sons, women or females may be in view. (laughs) You know, it's a possibility that females may be in view. Now, so either sons or children, we could discuss that more. So I'd be interested to find that reference. I'm not particularly familiar with it at this point. Some of the other things that hair symbolizes in the scriptures the phrase that Hoth used is power, honor, glory, and talent, God-given gifts. And we see this through, you know, Nazarite vow, or with Samuel, or with Samson, or with Absalom. You know, there's all these figures with this long, glorious hair that was representing their power, honor, glory, and talent. Or even with Esau, you know, he was hairy. He was the firstborn. He was the one who was to inherit... Um, his father's household, you know. So this is the symbol of hair. And so 
when discussing this, that's more so the aspect that we're going to be focusing on. However, if there is that verse in Proverbs that Stephen is referencing, that also fits perfectly into this in that the judgment which is upon the hair, the power, honor, glory, and talent, and the destruction of that hair, the humbling of that hair, what we have understood is that those who cling to their own power, honor, glory, and talent, they suffer the fate of that judgment. Right? In other, case, in other words, Ezekiel being a symbol of the children of Israel, northern and southern, right? The, four, the 390 for Israel, the 40 for Judah. His hair, if hair represents sons, represents his sons. So the children of the Reformation, in other words, is what his hair would represent under that connection of what Stephen's pointing out in Proverbs. Under the connection of these other things that we mentioned, power, honor, glory, and talent, God gives and gifts. So judgment is taking place. The first thing that takes place is a taking of the first third part, which a third part, Hadith went through a number of scriptures, particularly in the book, Tract 5, The Final Warning, which is on the seven trumpets, to show that a third part in the scripture typically represents the wicked, the third part of angels, the third part of this, the third part of that, the third part of grass. We won't go into the details of that, but it represents the wicked. A third part is taken, third part of hair, burned in the midst of the city, burned with fire in the midst of the city. So, remember, that's one thing. The other thing, the beginning of the judgment, according to Malachi 3, starts with a swift witness against the outstanding sins. In the harvest, the judgment, in the parable of the harvest, begins with a sickle being put to the grain. So the sickle in the harvest, the swift witness of Malachi, the, uh, the fire of the first, the burning of the first third part in Ezekiel 5, must all represent the same basic thing. Because they all are the first thing to take place in the judgment for the living, and they all bring judgment upon the people. So what basically we're, what we are going to look at is how this did take place in 1955. There was a message which came, which was a swift witness. There was a message represented by the sickle to harvest. There, and this is revealed in Revelation 14, by the way, as well, which we won't get into right now. But I cite you all to the dry bones extra study on the back table. It is the same thing as that burning of the first third part. Fire is a symbol of the Spirit. And the Spirit is truth. Fire is oftentimes a symbol of a message of inspired truth, a revelation, inspiration at work. A sickle, a harvesting instrument, right? We can see how grain being representative of human souls, people, the thing which harvests us is a message. Ellen White talked about the third angel harvesting you know, the third angel, that's the third angel's message. All right, so this sickle is the harvest instrument, the thing to gather the sheaves. It's the message, it's the truth. Yes, in the judgment. And so we have this, and then in Malachi 3, we get a little explanation of what this message is, right? And it's this message which first is a swift witness. And it's against the midst of the city is the first thing that takes place. So this... Unfortunately, we're going to be skipping over a lot of the evidence for the things that I'm going to say, just for sake of time. It's in the Ezekiel 5 study on the back table. But we want to go through this to understand what the chapter is talking about, to get an idea in our minds of what is happening. So, Jerusalem. We won't go through the verses right now to show why this is or how this is. But Jerusalem is oftentimes used in the scriptures for the leadership of the church, right? Because it's not, sometimes it's clearly in reference to the geographical location of Jerusalem. But other times there are messages given to Jerusalem where there's the prophet speaking to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was the capital city wherein dwelt 
the leadership. So, what we understand is that the judgment begins at the house of God. Victor Hoda went through a lot to show what that's about. What we understand is that, unfortunately, the Davidians did not become true Davidians in spirit. Hadaf had a timely greeting where he talked about Davidian or Laodicean witch, and he pointed out that a Laodicean is defined by the characteristics of being, you know, in a terrible condition, but thinking that you are in need of nothing, right? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked, and in need of nothing. That's a Laodicean. Hadaf said that a true Davidian is one who is wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, but knows that he is in need of everything, right? But by Davidians not becoming Davidians in spirit, not acknowledging that they are in need of everything, they remained in the Laodicean condition, right? And so Davidians had their own leadership. And Hadith, this, if you, if you read the, Moth, in the Rod message, you will learn that Hadith gave uh, ministerial credentials to those who were the full-time ministers of the Davidian message. Uh, in 1931, Hadith proclaimed that the storehouse of present truth had transferred from the General Conference to the Davidian Association, right? So clearly there was a Davidian ministry, a Davidian leadership. So when the branch message came in 1955, it first went to the Davidian leadership and there was a swift witness. It came very quickly against the sins that was being done by the leadership at the time. The first that we'll consider is sorcery. We won't be able to get into all the details of this, but I'm going to uh, point out a few things. We won't be able to read the passages, but uh, the word sorcery in the scriptures is also translated as witchcraft. It's the same word, witchcraft or sorcery. And in 1 Samuel 15.23, it says that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, right? We won't go into all the reasons why, but witchcraft and rebellion in Ezekiel 13, verses 1 to 7, and in Jeremiah 14.14, 14, is directly linked with false prophesying. Sorcery and false prophesying, private interpretation. Uh, our own fire, you know, Ellen White and the Bible and Victor Hoff talk about strange fire. This strange fire is that sorcery. This strange fire is that false prophesying, that private interpretation. Florence Hoff was bringing that forward, right? She was coming with her own private interpretations of the setting up of the kingdom, the slaying of Ezekiel 9, and all these things, right? So there's this swift witness against this sorcery and against adultery. And we won't go into all the aspects of that either. It's more detailed in the Ezekiel 5 study. But adultery, in one of its aspects, is serving other gods, right? That's what Israel was accused of so often in the Old Testament. They were adulterers for serving other gods. And when we serve other gods, Victor Hoff talks about two types of inspiration, divine inspiration and satanic inspiration. Many false prophets are either speaking from them, well, all false prophets are either speaking from themselves or they're getting inspiration, but from wicked gods. And this is adultery, right? Now this is what is being described in Malachi 3, the judgment against the sorcerers. And then there was against the false wearers, which again has to do with lying and this false prophesying. We'll get to some of the other aspects of this, but this is where those seven letters of Florence Hodef that you mentioned, Leroy, come in. We're also told in Malachi 3, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, he who is hired in his wages, the widow, the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. So when this message came of the branch, it came 
first, in 1955, to the leadership of this new pseudo-Davidian movement under Florence Hottis. And they were oppressing the hireling and his wages in that those who were supposed to be receiving pay from the association to carry forward the work full-time in the field by use of first tithe, all of a sudden that was taken from them. They weren't allowed to use the money which was rightfully theirs to live and to proclaim the message. And the second tithe was to be used for the widow and the fatherless and the stranger, you know. And that was taken as well. These things were stolen. And Ben Roden, he faithfully delivered the rebuke that the Lord had given against these evils. And there's one study that I'll reference you guys to called the Flying Scroll, a study of Zechariah chapter 5. And Ben Roden wrote this in rebuke in particular of the wickedness that was going on by the Davidian Association. And so these things were timely rebukes. Now this message, when it first came, first went to the Davidians, 1955. The Davidian leadership in particular. A year later, 1956, Ben Rodin started writing letters to the General Conference President, bringing this same message to the Adventist leadership. And as this message was refused, let me ask, does anyone remember, I'm sure a number of you guys have gone through Victor Hodov's study on the seven trumpets. And in the first trumpet, there was the burning of all grass. What did that burning represent? Anyone remember? Wasn't it a judgment? People. It was a, con a, a judgment. The grass represented people, right? What the burning of the grass represented is that the fire, the message of truth, brought through the Spirit, through inspiration, by them refusing it, they were burned. Their consciences were seared. They had grieved the Holy Spirit. Right? This burning of the first third part of hair in the midst of the city is the message going to the leadership, both of DSDA and SDA, and by their rejection of it, they grieved the spirit and their consciences were seared. This is burned. This is the judgment for the living. This is a progressive closing of individuals' probations as they refuse the light of truth. So the message from Ben Lord, mm -hmm. it's a writing to the conference, it's about, this is about the judgment of the living. Yes, he was announcing to them the truths which were to come at the end of the judgment for living, including Christ's new name, including, including the restitution the of, the judgment of the dead, you mean? Sorry, the commencement, I said, of the judgment for living, or did I say, yeah. okay, Dan, the commencement of the judgment for living. These truths included Christ's new name, the restitution of the statutes and ordinances, and the announcement that we are now in the judgment for the living. Now this is a serious thing. When he started writing this to the leadership, it was 1956. 1956, that very year, is when Martin, Walter Martin, and Barnhouse, evangelical scholars, Walter Martin was writing a book called The Kingdom of the Cult, and Adventists objected to their inclusion in this book as being a cult. So some of the Adventist leadership contacted Walter Martin and said, Hey, look, no, we're not like that. You know, so he's like, Okay, well, if you're saying you're not like that, I'm going to need that proven to me. I'm going to need free access to all of your information. I need to thoroughly scrutinize and examine your doctrine to see if you really are a cult. And if you're not a cult then we won't include you in this book. So that's what they did. They got together. 1956, at this same time, they're meeting with these guys. Ben Roden is writing them these letters. Let's keep that in mind. So what happens is they get there. These evangelical scholars start pouring through the Adventist literature, and they start saying, wait a second. You guys are saying that us Sunday-keeping churches are Babylon. Wait a second. You guys are saying that Christ entered the Most Holy Place in 1844 when we believe He entered the Most Holy Place upon His ascension. Wait a second, you're saying that Ellen White is inspired 
with the same authority and in the same manner as any of the other Bible prophets? If you hold to any of those three things, you surely are a cult. So what do they do? They said, okay, well, yeah, Christ did actually enter the most holy place upon his ascension. And no, you guys aren't really Babylon. It's really the Church of Rome. That's Babylon. And Ellen White, she's more uh, a counselor and guide to give direction just for us as a church. It's, her writings aren't for you guys. It's just our own personal counsel. Meanwhile, with Wagner and Jones in Kansas City, Missouri, I think it was, mm -hmm. she and Wagner and Jones spoke to more than 10,000 non-Adventists after 1888. Wow. Yeah, you see, the role of Ellen White in the Adventist Church and later as of Jones and Wagner was so significant and now they were turning their backs on this, right? Ben Roden, he, I forget which prophecy. So it's some sort of disclaimer on the Adventist party so that they were not dubbed a cult. Yeah, and Walter Martin at the end, because they were willing to compromise and to give up the foundations of Adventism, he actually came out saying... He came out and he got flack from the other Sunday keepers because he came out saying, actually, the, the Adventist church as a whole is not a cult. He said, there are those within the movement who hold to their older beliefs that should be considered cultic, but as a church, they're not a cult. That's what he came out saying because of their compromise. Okay, This, oh, it was a terrible thing. And there was, um, Stephen pointed out earlier, M. L. Andreasen, he was one of the Adventist scholars, and he was like, wait a second, whoa, you guys are giving up the pillars of our faith, and he started writing letters, objecting strongly, and showing from Ellen White's writings and from the scriptures, the investigative judgment, showing the Day of Atonement, showing the second angel's message, the first angel's message, the third angel's message, saying, we can't give up these messages, we can't compromise on these messages, and what ended up happening with him? He was stripped of his credentials, and he, his name was blackened, only to have him, after he died, have his credentials reinstituted to save face. It was a really bad situation, and to this day, the church is still suffering theologically, spiritually, in every way from the decisions that were made at that time. And then with the Desmond Ford incident, following that, Desmond Ford, actually I should mention something quickly first. There was a publication called Questions on Doctrine, which was the official Adventist response to Walter Martin and bon Barnhouse and the Evangelicals. What Desmond Ford did was basically accepted the same thing that Questions on Doctrine was saying, but just being a little bit more blunt with it. And when he started doing that, and getting some trouble within the church because there were still those who were holding to the more original, I should say, Adventist positions, he was starting to get in trouble. And then Walter Martin stepped back into the picture and was saying, hey, wait a second, how come you're giving Des Ford trouble when he's just saying the same things that Questions on Doctrine said, and that was your response to us in the 1950s, and that's the reason why we said that you guys aren't a cult. So if you're going to give Des four trouble for this, then maybe we're going to reconsider you being a cult. Right then, the Avenger said, okay, tightrope time. So then it's trying to balance not outright giving up Adventism, while at the same time trying to please the evangelicals. So since this time in the 80s with Des Ford and all that, Adventism's kind of been walking the tightrope, trying to not get anyone upset. Go ahead. I have a little bit of sympathies. I, I'm not sure what all that you're talking about relative to Desmond Ford, but relative to his apotelismatic principle, which is that the um, prophecy can have multiple fulfillments. Right. Um, the decision by the brethren at Glacier View, I believe, that was a good decision. Okay. That decision was this, that there must be in Scripture a control, 
as to whether or not there is another or more than one fulfillment. Mm. And I believe that that decision was a good decision. The thing of it is, is the Adventist church has not followed up on that decision as to what a balanced view at looking at prophecy and refulfillment of prophecy should be. Right. And um, the current um, Adventist peacekeeping group movement, I've had some fuss because there are Adventist peacekeepers mm -hmm. who are questioning those of us who look at Daniel and Revelation relative to end time events. Right. And I, I've rebuked them saying, look, I was there at the beginning and the feast keeping movement and the interest in the law of Moses was a sidebar that hit us upside the head. We were looking at statements from Ellen White where Ellen White was saying trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded in the future, mm -hmm. vial after vial poured out, mm -hmm. how... The, the church in the future is going to be the fulfillment of the first seal going forth conquering and to conquer and, and um, other statements from her regarding Daniel and Revelation the Savior's statement from Daniel when you see the abomination spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place mm -hmm. and then Ellen White says that the scenes that took place relative to the destruction of Jerusalem are going to be re repeated again in the future mm -hmm. in the introduction to 1911 great controversy she says the the things that are written on this book pertain to the events that will transpire prior to and then the very first chapter is the destruction of Jerusalem right. just prior to the second coming and and so uh, we have all these different statements uh, the current position of the Adventist Church is only the last half of the last verse of Revelation 11 is, remains to be fulfilled. But I have several statements, one very strong statement where Ellen White says, read Revelation 11, the entire chapter, and learn what will happen, future tense. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so um, she says that Daniel 12 is a warning that we must understand before the end. Mm -hmm. Well, then it turns out that Revelation 12 where it says a time, times, and, and, and dividing of times, yeah. is a direct quote from Daniel 12 that Ellen White says is future. Yeah. So if Daniel 12 is future, then, da then Revelation 12 is future. Okay? So, um, anyhow, I think that heaven used Desmond Ford, whether how much he was in heaven's hands, I don't know. Mm. But... He was used to agitate an issue. An issue definitely was agitated, that's for sure. Yeah. He was used to agitate an issue. I believe that the decision at Glacier View was a good decision, but there's not been a decent follow-up. Right. And that's been the, since the 1950s, that has been the Adventist mode of operation, of doing what it can to get through without much bruising when they're on the hot spot and then to just silently go through things without getting another hot spot to you know arise yeah just trying to stay out from being under pressure that's they went and um copyrighted the church's name yeah and in order to do that they had to change their bylaws or whatever so that they were no longer um what they had to do was they had to incorporate. Yeah, exactly. Okay, which makes them part of the state. Yeah. Okay, and then they started, once they did that, then they were able to use the copyright law to go after people having the name SDA and, and to persecute. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sad story. When, when I learned that B.B. Beach, Bert B. Beach, right, right. went to the Pope. Mm -hmm and handed him a gold medallion and virtually quoted Great Controversy where Ellen White says that Protestantism will be foremost in reaching across the abyss to clasp the hand of Rome. Right. And B.B. Beach, his words were, we must reach across the, the, the gulf between us 
and clasped the hands of our friends in Rome, meanwhile giving him a gold medallion that says, remember the Sabbath, but not stating what day of the week that is. Right. Okay, when I read that, then my eyes were opened. Right. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is the climax of the Reformation, and when the Reformation is in apostasy, it is, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the head of that apostasy. So sad but true. So, and actually, that is just the point of seeing how bad this movement has continued on. And from our perspective, the Davidians have done worse than the Adventists. Because we believe that Davidians have progressive truth from the Adventists and have gone even further in that apostasy. And that branch Davidians have gone even further in that apostasy. And it's a sad situation. And Ezekiel 5, I want to reference everyone here to, or Ezekiel 16, the Ezekiel 16 study on the back. And so now we want to really kind of try and focus on this again and try to like really get through a few more things. But Lauren, if you have something really pressing on, you go for it. Well, it, this brings us, what you just said brings us back to considering our leprosy right. and what Ezekiel 5 is saying about it. Because that's, that is what's so compelling to me about Doug Mitchell's papers on the dry bones, Ezekiel 16. Here is a piece of Adventism, a people within Adventism who are owning up to their leprous condition. This is tremendously significant because what we've been just been talking about is, is an Adventist people, including the Vidians, who are covering up. Exactly. But here comes a part of the branch Davidians who are owning up. And that's the significance of Ezekiel 5. Oh, it is. It's very significant. The whole thing, it's, again, I think it's called a, the Ezekiel 16 study has on the cover, a tale of woe and lament. You know, it is really bad, the condition that we've gotten into. It's really bad. And... What we see is that the Davidians, right, by the time Victor Hoff died, man, they should have known better. Victor Hoff talked about how in 1929, when the, uh, the whole situation happened again with, uh, what's the guy's name, where the, where the Vatican City got back control again? No, no, this is way before, this is 1929. You know, the whole situation with Vatican City getting control again, and he pointed out that that happened as a result of a downfall in the spiritual condition of Protestantism. And that the only reason why the wound was not completely healed was because the rod message was sent to continue Protestantism. Right? So Davidians should have learned these lessons. They should have realized the need of inspiration. And Tim, just before, in the break there, he mentioned to me uh, something that he learned re recently that's actually very significant in, about leprosy and how characteristic of leprosy was that it was actually a judgment upon those who refused to listen to the spirit of prophecy in their day. And I thought that was interesting. I'm, I'm sure Tim afterwards can share with us all or whatever more information on that. But... This is what the Davidians should have known. Hodaf taught some of these things so clearly and it was understood, but they chose to go with the proclaimed leadership at the time under Florence Hodaf, right? And so this situation just got worse and worse. So the Davidians, they should have been taking care of the sick and the poor and the widows and the fatherless among them, right? But instead they stole all the money which should have gone to them. They should have been helping those who were out there in the field doing the work of proclaiming the present truth message to be able to survive. But instead, they took that money. You know, these things were done, and the branch message came to be a judgment against that. Then in Adventism, the message went in 1956 to the Adventist leadership, and as a result of the refusal to accept the message, because here's the thing, 
right at that time, they were being told, hey, look, now we're in the judgment for the living. The judgment for the dead is over. And that if you don't accept the message of the judgment for the living, you're going to drop your sword of truth. And this is what Ben Rodin showed them from the prophecies, that they would drop their sword if they did not heed the message. So what happened? 1955, investigative judgment for the dead over. That no longer present truth, the message of the investigative judgment for the dead, the message of the investigative judgment for the living is present truth. They refused that message, and then they even lost the message of the investigative judgment for the dead that they have by compromising with Martin and Barnhouse and the Evangelicals in 1956. They lost their message. It was no longer present truth. Their light went out. And it's been out ever since, sadly. So this is that judgment on the first third part of hair. The Adventists, their power, honor, glory, and talent was burned up. They had it no longer. And those who tried to cling to it, they were seared, you know? So what we're going to do is move on from this to the next judgment, right? And we're going to try to go through this next judgment in a lot shorter period of time than we went through this first one, right? The next thing is, unfortunately we don't have an illustration for it, but it is smiting the hair round about the city with a sword, okay? And in, uh, in the King James Version of Ezekiel 5, the way it kind of looks is it says smite about it with a knife, and it sounds like it's smiting about the hair with a knife, smiting the hair. But in Hebrew, it's actually smite round about her with a knife. You take the third part of hair and smite it round about her being the city of Jerusalem with a knife. So the area surrounding the city, which represents the leadership, would be the laity, those that are not the leadership. And the sword represents the sword of truth. This was the branch message, especially with the revelation of the keeping of the feast days and the restitution of the daily and the ordinances and, you know, all the ceremonial law in antitype. These things came, and since the message had already gone to the leadership of SDA and DSDA, this time it went to the laity. But this time the message was represented not as a fire, but as a sword. But both represent truth, right? Both represent a message. But there is a distinction. And one of the reasons for the distinction is that a sword is primarily used in time of war. Right? Fire can be used in time of war as well, not as much in the ancient world as perhaps today, though it was used then as well. But fire has so many other purposes, and you think fire, you don't think war right away. You know what I mean? Sword is characteristic of war. When the message went to the laity, that's when there became the real battle. Because when you are talking to leadership, they may disagree with you, they may reject the message, but it's going to basically just settle at that, you know? But when you go and you're touching their flock, when you're taking the message to those who they are protective of, that's when the war begins, you know? And this is what happened when the branch message went to the respective laities, especially when the messages of the feast days came. And there was a war against that message of the feast days and the restitution of the ceremonial law, and against the branch and the rod all the more altogether. Now, so that's just, we're going to leave it at that for now on that judgment. There's a lot more in it. I'm probably not even going to look at the notes that I have here just to try and go through this faster. But there was another third part that received judgment. But this part was scattered to the wind. Singular. And I'll actually um, mention at least one thing about this. Lorna? I'm just wondering if we could tie that, that thing in about um, the, feast, the, the, the opposition to the feast days or the restoration of the, of the law. Right. Um, 
some of the fiercest opposition, in a sense, at least as I understand the history, the church itself didn't really even, wasn't even really connected enough to that to even know, consider it an issue. The real leaders who made war against the feast day truth were the Davidians. Uh, in a large to way, this, yes. To this day. Uh, there was the Davidians, both uh, the group Bashan and Donadare, and strong opposition. I shouldn't say strong in the sense of uh, strong intellectually or scripturally, but a hard opposition against the feast days in particular. In Adventism, the, thing, the same thing happened too, but to a lesser degree. Davidia, though, became very strongly opposed, and you can, Don Adair still has his papers against the feast days, and you can read them, and you can see the viciousness that's there against these things. Yeah, still to this day, and, and also the concern, the main concern being the flock. Right. Don't take my flock, don't oh, yeah. teach my flock to keep the feast. Oh. oh yeah, the main concern is definitely the flock. It's that protective thing, it's that, that thing of protecting the flock is so misunderstood where the shepherds are supposed to take care of their flock because people think that it's through censorship of other ideas when really it should be through education. Hey, let's educate everyone about this. Something else I want to consider in light of this second judgment, the judgment upon the hair round about the city, was kind of again into the investigative judgment as it connects to the parable of the harvest. Because in the harvest, the next thing to take place after the sickle is put to the grain is you gather the tares together in bundles to be burned. Not that they're burned right away, but you gather them together. If the grain represents the people, right? This is talking about gathering groups together. Sectarianism, in other words. This started taking place in Adventism and Davidia, primarily in the 1950s when the branch message went to the laity. Then, at that point, that's when we had these groups forming, you know, in Davidia. We had uh, Don Adair form his group, and he went out to South Carolina, and he had his own thing. And then uh, M.J. Bingham, he formed Bashan, and had his interpretation of the pastures and so on. And then you had... Um, uh, another group, Wanda Bloom, go off to California. And then after that, you had all these other groups forming their own groups and different sectarianism branching off. In the 1950s, in Adventism, you had the Sabbath rest movement kind of split off into their own thing as a result of the stuff with Martin and Barnhouse. And then you had schools of thought. You had those who were following M.L. Andreessen and those who were following the conference. And you see all these divisions rapidly taking place in the denomination. And there's more. I was, when I was uh, looking into this, I was looking more into different Adventist sects that formed as a result of what took place in the 50s. So, um, let's see. We're not going to be able to go too much further with this tonight since we've been on for so long already and some of you guys have a drive home and everything. But there are a couple more aspects that I did want to mention just to give us a little bit further of this picture. We won't really go more into the binding and bundles and the kind of the divisions that have taken place, but it's continued till today. You know, it still continues and there's still all this sectarianism going on, right? And basically that is all in connection with what took place with the message going to the laity. There's a third, third part though. Right? A third, third part of hair that was burned. We're not burned, but judgment came upon it. It says it was scattered to the wind. Thank you. I was just going to ask you to go to that. Awesome. Shows how much I turn around and look back, right? But it's, um, there's a third, third part which is scattered to the wind. And in the scriptures, there's winds and there's wind. And different contexts have different meanings of this. Right? There's times where a wind is a symbol of the Spirit. But here, it's definitely judgment. And when we get into the later portions of the chapter, we'll see how what this third, third part did and what happened to them was not a positive thing. 
So the wind in this context is not a positive symbol. It's like holding back the four winds. Yeah, like holding back the four winds, or you know, there's different contexts to this. In this, one example. Let's see if I have the scripture down here somewhere. Um, in Isaiah, it talks about people trying to prophesy, and they bring forth wind, and the idea is nothingness. The idea is nothingness in the symbolism. And these people are scattered, right? This hair is scattered, and it's scattered to nothingness, right? This is showing the condition that many of us have found ourselves in, of not necessarily being part of one of these bundles, so to speak, of one of these groups, but being scattered, you know, seeking kind of either believing the truth uh, as we understand it, and just finding ourselves scattered. And this, when we go through this a little bit more, it'll make more sense as it applies to us. But that was my condition. You know, I came into the Rod message, and I wasn't part of any association. I was just trying to learn the truth, and so many of us have been scattered. But what does this say? It says that there's a scattering, and this is what took place. A lot of people from the 1950s became independent Adventists because they could just see its confusion in there, right? Or independent Davidians, because, man, it was just bad. They were treating people bad. The leaderships were all power struggle and this and that. So people just scattered about. But what does the prophecy say? A sword was drawn out after them, right? The sword is the message of truth. So when people are scattered like this, our Heavenly Family isn't saying, all right, that's your judgment. Now you're scattered and I hope you find your way back home. No. Uh, the sword of truth is drawn out after them, saying, you know what? The truth is going to follow you. And this has been probably many of our experiences, you know, where as we're scattered, as we have been apart from all these groups, is where the most truth has found us. You know what I mean? And this is what, when I first, I'll tell you, when, when I first came across the branch message, and when I was investigating it, I had read through Ben Roden's stuff, and I couldn't deny it as truth. I had been reading through some of Lois's stuff, and to my shock, I couldn't deny it as truth, because I thought that the Holy Spirit feminine was a heresy. Then I started reading this stuff, and I was realizing that it actually has a far more solid ground to it than I ever could have imagined. And then I read Doug's study on Revelation 10, the introduction to the seven thunders. And I was blown away. And then he wrote the Ezekiel 5 study. And he sent it to me. This is when I was getting in contact with Doug. He sent it to me. And I started reading it. And I just had to keep reading. I finished the study in one sitting because I was just blown away by what I was reading. And when I got to this part about the sword of truth, you know, chasing after those who are scattered, I so saw myself there. That was my condition. That's where I was, yeah. you know? And that's where most of us here are at. And in this chapter, we won't be able to get to it tonight, but there's a repetition of this, where it talks about a second phase of things happening to these same three parts. It's in verse 12. And there is an explanation of, again, the sort of truth going after those who are scattered in the second instance, in verse 12, not to the wind, not to nothingness, but to the winds. And we're going to get to that when we get there, but we won't be able to do that now. But I wanted to mention, that's the third, third part. The next thing is that there was a small portion, few in number, who were bound in Ezekiel's skirt, some translations say, or garment, or wing. Part of that is that it's protection. Those, I'll mention this too, under the idea of wing in that, wings in the scriptures, one of the things that they can represent is truth. Psalm uh, 91 verse 4 talks about, you know, uh, sh uh, have your truth be as a shield to me or something like that. It's being protected uh, by the wing of truth. Maybe we should just read the verse because I'm not quoting it properly. It's Psalm 91 verse 4. Would you be able to read that quick? He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Right. 
So under his wings, his truth shall be thy shield. You know, and then also in Ezekiel chapter 1, it talks about the flapping of the wings of the cherubim, and it was as the voice of El Shaddai. Right? The flapping of the wings, as the voice of El Shaddai. Wings can be a symbol of truth. And so this, with the wing of Ezekiel's garment, he bound a few in number of the hair. In other words, they were protected because they were in the truth. They were in, you know, this we understand to be a symbol of those who had accepted the branch. They were permitted to be preserved from the judgments which came upon the three third parts of hair. And there, their power, honor, glory, and talent was preserved, the hair. It was preserved from that judgment. But then there was to be of them taken another portion. Some of them were to be taken and cast in the midst of the fire, which was in the midst of the city, right? Now this aspect, and we're just going to touch on this a bit, and then we'll end up closing off pretty shortly. The first time that there was a burning of fire, in the midst of the city, that was representing a fresh revelation of truth, right? The beginning of the branch message. Now we've gone through, we've seen these judgments and how they've played out and created the conditions of Adventism and Davidia today, right? Now there was that preserved portion, the branches. But of them there was taken and thrown into the midst of the fire. So, and just like the first burning of hair in the midst of the fire, representative of a fresh revelation of truth and a judgment upon those who rejected it, just so it is in the second instance. This time there was another fresh revelation of truth, and that was the revelation of our Heavenly Family as brought in the message of the Holy Spirit feminine by Lois Roden. And particularly at the time, it was in the midst of the city, right, that there was the burning of hair. This is because it was among the leadership, again, this time of the branches at first, that the judgment came. And in those who were as part of the leadership, when Lois Roden brought her message, even in the branch movement, they resisted strongly the truth that she had. Even her own son, George Roden, opposed her outright. Even though Ben Roden was teaching the Holy Spirit Feminine along with her for that last year, from 1977, when it was first revealed, to 1978, uh, when he died. And then there was, just to give you some examples, uh, Clive Doyle, he was the head printer for the association. He uh, was refusing and rejecting the Holy Spirit feminine message. Another one, um, Perry Jones, he was the editor and the press director of the association. And he was resisting the spirit of the Holy, uh, or the message of the Holy Spirit feminine. All these people ended up in really bad situations. Perry Jones and Clive Doyle were the first. Perry Jones was actually the first to die in 1993 when the incident happened. And he, you know, he went with David Koresh. Clive Doyle also went with David Koresh. And he lost his daughter in the fire. And he himself had very severe burns. George Roden, he ended up uh, going more and more literally into insanity. He ended up in an insane asylum after having a shootout with David Koresh. You know, it was bad. These things dramatically affected the branch movement, and especially when things got worse too, was 1981. Lois Roden instituted the keeping of the Lord's Supper daily, along with the foot washing, at New Mount Carmel Center. And the reason why there was the foot washing included daily and everything as well is because there was a need for such thorough self-examination because the people were in such a bad condition in their outright rebellion against the message of present truth that had been given. And those who refused to examine themselves ended up either going with David Koresh or going with, you met Charles Pace, or, you know, there was all these situations and there was confusion. You know, 
I also know somebody named Sidney Davis. Okay. I'm familiar with the name, but not too much with the person. Yeah. Um, when he learned that I was embracing this message, he, he was saying, oh, this is rank heresy. Right. But in the meantime, he told me his, his, the story of his experience. Mm -hmm. And he was very badly treated uh, by those who were embracing the family. Right. Um, I don't know, somehow we need to treat those who oppose us more kindly. Oh, yeah. Oh, certainly. It's been bad. The, what the Ezekiel 16 prophecy goes into, I just want to mention this. We won't have time to go through it now. Maybe after the feast, Teresa and I will still be here. Maybe we'll have time to go through it then. But what Ezekiel 16 shows, it talks about three sisters. It has a mother and three sisters. The mother is Jerusalem. The daughter is Jerusalem the daughter. And then there's the two sisters of Jerusalem, Samaria and Sodom. And the prophecy of Ezekiel is 100% contrary to history as to what happened to Sodom and Samaria. And it's very clear that it's figurative. And what it goes through, and I'll just state it now, but you can go through, the study goes through and gives very solid reason, reasons for this being the case. That Samaria is representative of the SDA movement, Sodom of the Davidian movement, and the daughter of Jerusalem as the branch. And in that it's said very clearly that Sodom has done worse than Samaria, and that the daughter of Jerusalem has done worse than her two sisters. The branch what, what we believe as believers in this message is that the true movement of the branch has done worse, has committed worse and greater abominations than Davidia and than Adventism and are in a worse state of apostasy. And going through Ezekiel 5 reveals this terribly. And Ezekiel 16 reveals this terribly. But there is a solution, and that's what this message is about, okay? And that's what we want to get at. And that's what hopefully on Sunday I want to be discussing with you guys a little bit more. But, amen. amen. <laughs> I want to mention here that what it reveals here in Ezekiel 5 is that as a result of that second burning of fire in the midst of the city, which we believe is a symbol of the revelation of the Holy Spirit Feminine and the message that Lois wrote and brought, as a result of that burning, the rejection by those in the movement of the branch, in the leadership, by a result of them grieving the Spirit and allowing their consciences to be seared, the fire was to go forth to the whole house of Israel. And historically what happened in recent history is that as a result, of not allowing the precious truth of our heavenly family to convert their souls, they instead went into rebellion of the worst kind. And especially with the incident with David Koresh. You know, they, some of these people ended up going with David Koresh. He ended up, and I, I want to, you guys all to know that when I talk about David Koresh, it's something that I have personally taken the time to give a candid hearing. When I was investigating the branch message, you know, there's all these different things. There's, there's Charles Pace, there's Tom and Linda Caldwell, there's David Koresh, there was Doug Mitchell, there was all these different things, George Roden. There's all these different things claiming to be the true representation of the branch movement. And I was set to investigate them all. I knew I had to. And I knew that media lies. So I wasn't going to listen to what they say about David Koresh. So I searched and searched and searched and got hours and hours and hours and hours worth. I probably have 50 separate sermons of David Koresh talking, giving his message. He didn't write. Part of his message was that it was to be audible, not uh, written. And I listened to everything that I could find of him more than once, prayerfully, studying through with the scriptures, trying to understand 
if it was true or if it was not true. And at the end, I had to come up with the conclusion by the scriptures that it was not true. Doctrinally, and I, you know, there are probably very few people in the world who can go through and explain from the scriptures why David Koresh's message wasn't true. Because, I mean, who's going to investigate that, right? <laughs> but it's kind of like, you know, I had to go through that. And in going through that, I saw the deception. And I saw the inspiration. But unfortunately, it was not inspiration from our heavenly family. It was satanic inspiration that he had. And the message that he had ended up doing the exact opposite of what the branch message was supposed to do. It was the message of our heavenly family. It was supposed to be the message of Elijah, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the restoration of the law of Moses, the turning of the hearts of the parents to the children and of the children to the parents. But in the message and movement of David Koresh, it ended up going to the point where he placed himself in the place of Christ and placed himself in the place of the Holy Spirit and where he ended up breaking up these families where men, your wives are no longer yours. You can no longer have intimacy with them. And that I am the Lamb because I reveal the seven seals. This is what he was saying. And that the marriage of the Lamb is my marriage to all women. And he had his reasons for saying that. And so all women were rightfully his, according to him. And he abused the children. He separated these families. It's the exact opposite of what the true branch message is about. And because of that, what happened? Well, all those in the world say, aha, those Adventists. Aha, those Davidians. Aha, those branch Davidians. And Adventists say, aha, those Davidians. Davidians say, aha, those branch Davidians. You know, this thing is used. This fire, I'll put it like this, the fire of the message, because of the incident with David Koresh, and subsequently because of the, misrepresenta the misrepresentation of the true branch message by people like Charles Pace and others, Unfortunately, and the reason why I'm mentioning some of these names is because Charles Pace is currently living at the location of Newmont Commons Center, and the world looks at him as being the representation of the branch. But he's teaching that the Sabbath is truly on Sunday, and there was a whole lot of other big doctrinal issues that misrepresent the branch movement. And it has to be understood that as a result of the refusal to take this message of the Heavenly Family into the innermost sanctuary of our minds, as a result of the refusal to do that, that is what allowed the incident with David Kresh to take place. That is what allowed the misrepresentation through the message that Charles Pace has to take place, and all the confusion of the branch. And this is the fire going to the whole house of Israel. Everyone hears of this, everyone hears about the David Kresh thing, and they use that to be able to justify them in refusing the fire, in refusing the spirit, in refusing the message of present truth. So we've really gotten ourselves in a rut, you know? We are bad off. Bad off. We're not only saying that we're condemned as a movement, but we're saying that Yahweh condemns us as a movement. But it's not a condemnation unto hell. It's a condemnation of our condition. But that there is a remedy. Ezekiel 37 goes through the same thing. We believe in the studies on the back table, you guys can check it out, the dry bones extra. We believe that the dead dry bones is a representation of the condition of God's people today and over the past however many hundreds of years and that there is a reformation of these bones. Ezekiel was told to prophesy to the bones. We believe that him prophesying was a symbol of the messages of the Reformation. Adventism was supposed to be the fulfillment of the Reformation. We believe that all these stages in Ezekiel's prophecy are significant. First, there was a great noise. We believe that's the first angel's message. The reasons are given 
in the track. We won't be able to go through it. And then there was a shaking. We believe that's the second angel's message. The shaking among the churches and the controversy and the war that went on over the proclamation that Babylon is fallen, come out of her, my people. Bone comes together with bone. Organization. We believe that this bone coming together with bone is a symbol of the third angel's message and the work under Ellen White. Then was laid upon them sinews, which is like the tendons, some of the strength, the strength, the meat of the body. We believe that that's a representation of the message under Victor Hodges. And then there was the flesh, which is the word that's used in Hebrew there is representing the bodily organs, the things which allow the blood to flow. We believe that this is a message, representation of the message brought by Ben Roden, restor- restoring the feast days, the organs of the body of Christ. And then was laid upon the skin, which we believe is the message of the Holy Spirit feminine as brought by Lois Roden. The skin is that which beautifies the body. The feminine is the beauty of Torah and prophets and scripture. That's the message that beautifies. But at the end, after receiving all these messages, the dry bones are left as reformed, lifeless bodies, still dead in trespasses and sins. So Ezekiel was told to prophesy again. This time, not to the bones, but to the Spirit, to come from the four winds and breathe life to these bones. We believe that that prophesying to the Spirit to come and breathe life was another prophetic message which was brought by Doug Mitchell, showing the dry bones, showing Ezekiel 5 and Ezekiel 16 and how terrible of a condition that we've been in, and not how terrible of a condition they, you know, the outward they have been in, but we, Doug Mitchell himself, me, Trent Wilde, myself, all of us dead dry bones. But the good news is that the next thing in the prophecy is that the Spirit comes and breathes life. That's what this message is about. That's what we're proclaiming today. We believe and we proclaim and we cannot deny that the Spirit has come and is breathing life into these dead, dry bones. And this is what we want to talk about on Sunday. This resurrection is the resurrection of Christ in His people. Sunday is the offering of the wave sheaf. That's Christ's resurrection, right? This is something we want to talk about. But this, we believe that this is so vitally important. If we've been dead, dry bones this whole time, Resurrection is what we need, you know? And so that's our message, that we can be saved from our sins. Laura? We can tie that right into our mother, Sister Ellen. <laughs> because she, Beautiful. Yeah, because she said, she pointed this out, that, that the, the essential thing that we need to do with the Laodicean message is to take it personal. Exactly. Not, and she also made a comment, I can't give the reference, but but it, it just startled me. I, I always used to wonder, how can people sit under sermons given about this Laodicean message and not, and it not change them? Mm-hmm. And I found the answer in Ellen White. It's because they apply it to their neighbor. Exactly. They hear it, oh, yeah. they take it in, their heart responds and applies it to their neighbor. Mm-hmm. And so that's such an essential thing for the Adventist movement of whatever stripe or historical place. Make that switch and start to take the Laodicean message into our own heart. Personally. Totally. We have to. We absolutely must. If we are to receive the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans, to buy the gold and, you know, all these things, the positive things, we have to recognize that even that negative part of that Laodicean message is talking to us personally, right? So as we're listening to this, let's not just take it and say, wow, those Branch Davidians sure did bad, you know? No, we need to recognize that if we're going to accept these truths which were brought through this Branch message, that we are part of this dry bones, 
or even if we just accept the divinity message or just the Adventist message or whatever. And the dry bones is broader than that, by the way. It's broader than just Adventism, you know. We have to take the Laodicean message seriously. We have to take the message of the dry bones seriously. And it is the dry bones who receive the resurrection. They're the ones who cry out. Our hope is lost. Our bones are dry. And we are utterly cut off. And if we don't cry that out and acknowledge our dead condition, then we aren't part of the dry bones that that prophecy speaks of, the ones that receive that resurrection. Ellen White talks about the necessity of seeing the worst of our case to receive life. So let's see it. Let's see it and let's... It's tough. We know it's tough and it's sad and it's miserable and it's lamentable. But let's see it and in that, that's the point where we will see the love of our Heavenly Family more than ever before. Because we will see that as much of a screw-up as we are, that even in that, our Heavenly Family has the most incredible love for us Amen. to save us out of that. Lorna. I want to add an, a qualification to that. In, in that the judgment comes first to the ancient men. Mm -hmm. And the angel of Laodicea, as we're, we understand, it, is the leadership. Yes. Not to take away our own personal responsibility. And Brother Hodge said, primarily it's the lay people who are going to respond to this call. Right. But we also do need to see that the responsibility for the condition we're in is, is laid heavily on the leadership, as it should be. Oh, so the true. The parent is the responsible one for yes. the child's condition. And so to kind of just broaden that out a little bit, it's not just us poor little lay members right. that have to carry all that weight. It is primarily the leaders who have failed in this regard. To expand on that, we'll have to say it is true that as a result of the poor, poor decisions that the Adventist leadership made, that is largely the reason why the laity are in the condition they are. And that is largely why we haven't moved on with truth. And to continue subsequently with that, as a result of the poor, poor decisions that the Davidian leadership and subsequently leaderships have made, that is why Davidia the Davidian laity are largely in the condition that they are. As a result of the poor decisions and the faithlessness of the branch Davidian leadership, that is largely why the branches are in such a terrible condition as they are. But it's more than that. The poor results of the decisions of the Davidian leadership are not only responsible for the Davidian lethargy, but for the Adventist lethargy as well, because if they had lived up to the light they had, they would have been able to faithfully bear the message of present truth to the Adventists. The branch leadership and the branches, if they and if we had been faithful, and if we had chosen to be responsive to the Spirit, then we would have been able to faithfully take that message to the Davidians, and to the Adventists, but we haven't been. As branches, we have failed the Davidians. As branches, we have failed the Adventists and the whole world. As branches, we have failed each other. And most importantly, we've failed our Heavenly Family. But this is what needs to change, and this is what this message is about, to say, hey, look. And for those of you who have been hearing it for the past year, you know, you know that this message is about the love of our Heavenly Family and their power to change us and to free us from that death and trespasses and sins, to resurrect these dry bones. Lorna? <laughs> okay, let's bring it home now. Um, the, there is a line of leadership mm -hmm. within the branch oh, yeah. who have been doing their proper job 
That's what I see. Doug Mitchell in writing the condition, mm -hmm. in writing the truth about the condition, tying it into scripture. It's scripture talking about this condition, yeah. and Doug was willing to look at it and write it. Mm -hmm. There is the beginning of the turnaround of a proper leadership. You know, the Ezekiel 34, you know, the, the false shepherds. Yeah. And then God says, enough already. I'm taking the thing in my own hands. I'm going to give you a proper leadership. That is what I see through the, this line, Doug, and then passing to yourself, that we're finally hearing a proper leadership on this Laodicean message thing. Well, praise our Heavenly Family for that, because we have all failed so much that it is past due to have some life in this valley oh, you know it is past due and you know the time where this kind of revelation more so of the dry bones started to happen not specifically of these prophecies Ezekiel 37 Ezekiel 5 Ezekiel 16 but the condition it was when the Holy Spirit feminine was revealed when Lois Roden begun with her message of the Holy Spirit feminine it was automatic that the Spirit would also reveal the need to be born again because we're born of the Spirit. And so she was talking and showing the branches at that time. She didn't talk to the Davidians about this or to the Adventists because home needed to be dealt with first. You know, she was trying to urge upon them the need to be born again. And because of refusal of that in connection with the message of the Holy Spirit feminine and how we need to be born of her, that is what largely resulted in this condition. And then Doug... That, that makes sense because the Holy Spirit brings the truth oh, yeah. that, and then that's the guidance. Yeah. So it's like a turning point. If you don't follow that guidance, you quench the Spirit. Yeah. So it's been a sad condition. But again, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to necessarily go back to Ezekiel 5. So I'll just briefly mention that here in Ezekiel 5, what follows this is Yahweh saying, these are the people who have failed to keep my statutes and my judgments and this and that, and, you know, brings a rebuke and says that as a result of this, you're going to have to receive more severity of judgment. But this severity of judgment is not just severity of judgment. It does reference in this chapter, Ezekiel 5, a slaying of the wicked. But it also presents a hope, you know? Because the dry bones are really all wicked, you know? We've all been living in wickedness. But it shows a repetition in verse 12. I mentioned this before. It shows a repetition of these judgments. I'll just read it quickly in verse 12. It says, A third part of thee shall die with the pestilence, and with the famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee. And the third part of thee shall fall by the sword round about thee, and I will scatter the third part into all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. I'm not going to go into detail on this, but I'm just going to briefly explain those three parts to help bring us up to date. The first thing was, a third part of thee will die with pestilence, and with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee. This, in the prophecy, is after the fire gets spread to the whole house of Israel, right? So we believe that this brings us after the whole incident with David Koresh and after the uh, basically infamy of the branch, you know? And here there is pestilence and famine, which naturally go together. The famine is a famine for the word because there is a a lack of present truth happening in largely throughout Adventism and Davidia and even in the branch, you know, the Jacob has been lean, as it says in uh, Isaiah 17, the leanness of Jacob. And actually, as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, man, there are a lot of other aspects. Maybe we will come back to Ezekiel 5 to get into this some more. But there is a famine that has been going on upon the leadership. Again, the, the third part here, again, in verse 12, 
is that same third part, the leadership that was mentioned in the first part of Ezekiel 5. So the leaderships of all these organizations of Adventists, Davidians, and Branches, and actually, could you just keep it for now just because I want to quickly sum up the whole thing and then we'll be basically done and, you know. It's, there's been a famine for the word and as a result, when there's famine, people resort to eating unclean things and as a result, get disease pestilence. And that's what's been happening in all these leaderships, giving into private interpretation, eating the unclean things. So famine, pestilence, no true food to eat, spiritually speaking, eating unclean food, getting disease. That's been the condition of the leaderships, especially since everything happened in 1993. Then another third part, and it says that they will die from that. Right? That's the other thing to point out. The other one, it didn't mention anything about death, but this is a death from a famine of the word. And this, of course, speaking spiritually death. There's something to point out here. There's the death of the dry bones, right? All dead in trespasses and sins. There's another type of negative symbolic death, which is where someone comes to the point of grieving the spirit and their personal probation has closed. Okay? That's the death that is being spoken of in this verse. This isn't to say that everyone in all these leaderships has a closed probation, but that people in these leaderships individually have been having their personal probations closing, which is a dreadful thought. The next part is that a third part of thee shall fall by the sword round about thee. So lady, again, fall, fall by the sword, that's used so often in scripture to die in the battle you know through this battling with truth among the laity of these movements people have become so hardened and have been dying spiritually speaking you know already dead in trespass and sins but coming to the point of grieving the spirit and saying i'm done i'm just done with this and that third part it says or the next third part actually it says, and I will scatter a third part into all the winds. So those who are formerly scattered to the winds, scattered to nothingness, and who, okay, I'm just going to go and believe in Adventism on my own. Or I'm just going to go and I'm going to believe in Davidianism on my own. This next stage of the judgment is that now that you've been scattered to the wind, and now that unfortunately you still have remained in your dead dry bones condition, and as a result of your own choices and the choices of the leadership who create your circumstances, now I will scatter you to the winds. No longer just the wind, no longer just the nothingness, but now scatter into all these winds of doctrine, which is why around us today, we see so often all these people who have been independent or whatever, carried away with all these winds of doctrine, whether it be, I'm not even going to go into a bunch of examples, because we all know that there's all these winds of doctrine around about us, all these theories, all this private interpretation, and this scattered third part, this is what predominantly has been happening to them, scattered to all the winds. But for them, unlike the other two, the lady and the ministry, who are said to die, the leadership die by the famine and pestilence, and the lady to fall by the sword, it doesn't mention anything about dying for this third, third part in this second time round. This time it says, I will draw out a sword after them. The first time it said the exact same thing. So notice here, the first third part, both instances, there's a change, there's a change in the judgment and it's severe. And the second time there's a die, people's probation, or there's a, a death, people's probation is closing. In the second, third part, there's death. They fall by the sword. People's probation is closing. But the third, third part, those who were initially scattered to the wind and then scattered to all the winds of doctrine, they have a sword go out after them. We believe that this is representation of this message and that at least in this beginning part of it, those who are reached will likely be predominantly those scattered independent ones. This is basically what we're seeing happening now. 
you know? And this is the hope that we don't refuse the sword of truth this time, but that we take it up. <laughs> you know, we take it up and accept the truth. And accept not only the truth as a theory, because this message, to be truthful, cannot be accepted as a theory. This message, if it's not accepted into the innermost sanctuary, it is not accepted at all. It's rejected. We may try to convince ourselves that we accept it, but this message, you know, we've talked about it. In Ezekiel's representation, there's all these things representative of messages. In Ezekiel, there's not really a representation of this as a message. It's a representation of this as an experience. It's our sister breathing life into us. And when she does, according to the Psalms, which hopefully we'll get into later, she does give truth. She does give a message. But it's the experience that's important, you know. And that's, that is what we are about today. This is our focus. Our focus is the gospel. We believe that the gospel has been lost, has been downtrodden, and that now it's revived and it's here. Lorna likes to say revitalized, <laughs> the vitalized message. And the opportunity is here for each of us to accept that life and to be raised from death and trespasses and sins. We've seen the worst of our case corporately, now I hope that everyone here is willing to see the worst of your own cases individually, but don't allow the devil to trap you there. Christ couldn't see past the grave, and you not, may not be able to see past the grave either. You may think that your death to self is going to be the end of you, period. But I guarantee you, and the scriptures guarantee you, that if you accept Christ's death as your own, He rose from the dead, and you will too. And this time, with a new life, not your own, but His life. So this is the message we bear, and these are the things which we have seen, and our hands have touched, and we have handled. So let's praise our Heavenly Family. Shall we just close with prayer? and then we can discuss if need be. Alright. Heavenly Family, thank you so much. Thank you for your love and your truth, and thank you for bearing with us so long while we have been corporately and individually perpetuating and increasing apostasy. And that's not just apostasy from a truth or from a doctrine or from a, a set of fundamental beliefs. It's apostasy from you and from love and from righteousness. Heavenly Family, thank you for giving each person here the strength to be able to last this long through this meeting, even though the topic has potential, if misused by the devil, to be discouraging. I thank you so, so much, sister, for bearing along with us, even after being slighted and abused. And brother, we don't want you to have to bleed needlessly anymore. We want you to be able to finally be able to finish this intercession, to have all of us gathered into your love and into your righteousness, no longer breaking your heart and breaking your heart. We truly do want to just give ourselves fully to you. Thank you so much, Heavenly Family. Thank you again for gathering all of us here. 
I really do want to thank you for each individual here. And I just want to ask that you show each person here and give each person here right now a fuller revelation of your love than we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And that you show us clearly as individuals how we have been a part of the problem and how we've been dead in trespasses and sins and we've had these dry bones. I really just want to ask that you impress that upon everyone here as much as they're able to bear. And of course, you know the truth of each one here. So show us the truth of ourselves. And in that, I just ask that you please not allow the devil to just keep people there. But I ask that you show them and show us all that despite our dryness of bones, despite our mouths being like an open sepulcher and injurious disease coming forth from us, I ask that you show us all that despite that, you love us mm -hmm. and that you want to gather us under your wings. And that you want to just <sighs> mother us and father us, mm -hmm. give us a new life, and lead us as your children through all your paths of righteousness so that we can show your love to all the people who we have unfortunately had this lack of love towards. Thank you so much, Heavenly Family. Mm -hmm. Thank you for everything. And Father, Mother, it is in the name of your beloved and beautiful son and daughter, the branch she and she, we ask these things. Amen. Mm -hmm.